this takes place at a, at a very uh, somber time, right? Uh, we see we've been following very closely the developments in Israel over the last few days. Uh, we know that you have had a warm relationship with the country. You led a trade delegation there. It's been one of Maryland's top trade partners as well. Uh, you signed the executive order uh, prohibiting companies who, are, who have boycotted the country uh, from doing business with the state. And you've also spoken at the Republican Jewish uh, Coalition. I mean, I want to start and, and give you an opportunity to kind of chime in on, on your thoughts on how you see everything unfolding over the last few days. Well, it's, uh, I think we've all been glued to the news and trying to get as much information as we can. It's just a horrific situation, the brutality of uh, some of these terrorist acts with innocent uh, you know, women and children and elderly people being dragged off or being killed is just, uh, it's hard to fathom. Uh, I think this is a very uh, dangerous time in the Middle East and a very volatile situation, but I think we've got to be unequivocal. Um, I think the U.S. Uh, has to stand with Israel against these terrorist acts. Um, they are our, our greatest ally, and I think it's very important for America not to show weakness, uh, for us to make sure that, we, that our allies know that we're going to stand with them and that our enemies know that we're going to stand up to them. And uh, so we're watching it very, very closely. Our prayers are with the, with the people there in Israel. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think this is a time for politics. I think this is a time for us to come together uh, the way they are in Israel and, uh, and fight a common en enemy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this all also takes place as our Republican-led House is in disarray. We have no leader right now. This is, again, a, a, a very serious uh, moment where we, I mean, we, we need a leader in the, in the House at this point. Um, I mean, what do you make of everything that's happened in the House over the last few days as well? It's a train wreck. I mean, it's, uh, it's embarrassing. And uh, I think it's terrible for the Republican Party. I think it's terrible for, for the Congress and for the country. Um, the fact that you can have a handful of uh, extremist kind of quacks uh, off the rails that can put us in this kind of jeopardy. Uh, you know, 94% of the Republican caucus supported Kevin McCarthy. You have one guy that's not really a Republican or a conservative that is more interested in, uh, you know, social media and more interested in performative politics than he is in solving any problems, drives us into a ditch. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's outrageous, and it was a terrible mistake. It would have been a mistake anyway, and, and, and then it's in the middle of an election year. Where we're trying to show that we can govern, and we're showing that we can't. We, we're proving what everybody hates about Washington. It's nothing but divisiveness and dysfunction, that they can't uh, get out of their own way. And uh, to, to make matters worse, we're now in you know, multiple crises around the world with the war in Ukraine and uh, this war in the Middle East, and we're rudderless. So uh, it's very important that we get this resolved. And uh, I don't have a lot of inside sc uh, scoop on what's happening. I do talk to some members of Congress, and it's still very fluid. Um, there, I think uh, you know, they're having discussions now. We're going to hopefully get to some type of a vote tomorrow, but it's, I don't think there's any guarantee that it's going to get resolved quickly. Yeah, and you're obviously a, a big fan of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had this great relationship with Tip O'Neill. I mean, is that even possible again in Washington? Well, some people, you know, I, I, I'm an old guy, so I, I, you know, say I, I look back to the past, but I, I was a, I was a uh, chairman of Youth for Reagan. I was a Reagan delegate, and I think, you know, Reagan's, not only his doctrine of peace through strength, Reagan did stand up for our allies and stand up to our enemies. So I think Reagan's, the Reagan doctrine, Reagan policy, is really pertinent right now with the issues we're having around the world. But also his leadership on kind of uniting people and being willing to work across the aisle to find common ground and to compromise. He's a perfect example of, uh, you know, he and Tip O'Neill had passionate disagreements. Republicans and Democrats had issues that they uh, really disagreed on, but they never were disagreeable. And they sat down together and they tried to hammer out compromise, which I think is what's really missing and lacking in today's environment. Um, it's something I believe very passionately in. I was, um, I was a Republican governor in the bluest state in America. I uh, worked for eight years getting things done with a 
legislative body that was, you know, 70, 75 percent progressive Democrats in both houses, and yet we came together with a whole host of common sense bipartisan solutions. It's exactly what should be happening in Washington. You know, we're just 30 miles down the road as our state capital of Annapolis, and we sort of showed that it was possible. Um, but this this uh, Congress continues to uh, show that they can't work together and can't get things done. And frankly, you know, I'm, I started out saying my party's in disarray in Congress, but it's it's really, you know, both parties. You know, that's why 70 percent of the people in America are just completely frustrated with Democrats and Republicans. They believe that Washington is broken, that our entire political system is uh, dysfunctional. And, uh, and what they really want is what we were able to deliver next door in Maryland. They want their elected leaders, regardless of their party affiliation, to sit down and work together on solving the real problems that people are concerned about, that are facing the nation and facing all of us. What type of leader do, do, do you think the House needs right now from the Republican side? And, and are any of the candidates that we've been hearing about uh, best positioned to, to fill that role, in your opinion? I think we need somebody that uh, can kind of do what I was just talking about. I mean, we've got to find a leader. And I'm not volunteering for the job, by the way. I, mean, I wasn't, uh, think you're eligible, right? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, that sounds like the worst job ever. Uh, but I, I think we need somebody that is uh, strong, uh, that can you know, bring people together, uh, but that's conciliatory, that's willing to work across the aisle. You know, we're, we're really in a dangerous time. Uh, the country's got some serious problems. There are world, you know, problems that we've got to deal with. We can't be dysfunctional. So I don't know who that is. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're, you know, we say there are two candidates that may or may I'm not sure if either one of them is going to get the votes. I think it's certainly possible that there could be uh, another Dark horse compromise candidate. I just I don't know what's going to come down, but I think whoever uh, they pick has got to really put, try to put aside some of the politics and focus on the issues, particularly with the dangers that we have around the world. We can't just be taking shots at the other side. It's like Democrats and Republicans pointing fingers, trying to score points. People seem more interested in uh, you know performative politics and. You know, they'd rather win an argument on Twitter than actually fix a problem, and that, that's something we got to get away from. Now, you've been out front for the better part of the last year, year and a half, uh, with these type of statements where you're willing to criticize both your own party but then also Democrats as well. So I think I've been doing that since I first got involved in politics and ran for governor in 2014, not just a year and a half. I mean, I've been pretty outspoken, and I usually call them like I see them. I mean, sometimes I'll take on when I think... When I think uh, Democrat policy, the Democratic leaders are in the wrong, I, I say so. When I think the Republican leaders are in the wrong, I say so. And I think uh, I think that's probably why people appreciate me, whether they agree with me or not. They they know where I'm coming from, and they know that I'm going to you know say exactly what I think. Yeah. And now your father is sticking with the House. I mean, he was uh, famously he gave he delivered the speech. Uh, about impeaching Nixon, uh, yeah, it's, the first Republican to do so. How does that guide you in this moment? Well, I was, a, I was in high school at the time. It, uh, I, I learned a lot about integrity and public service from my dad. He was a, he was a Republican on the House Judiciary Committee. This is now we're coming up this spring. It'll be 50 years. It's hard to believe. That, you know, that's, that's how long ago it is. But they're, it's very relevant today, uh, given some of the concerns that we have. Uh, we don't have a lot of leaders like like that anymore. We need some. Uh, but my, uh, my dad was uh, a Nixon supporter, campaigned with him, uh, thought he was doing a good job as president, fought back when he thought the Democrats were being partisan, or he fought to make sure that they could provide for the defense, that they could cross-examine witnesses. But after seeing the evidence, he made the decision and came out with a speech that said uh, the president was guilty of impeachable offenses and should be removed from office. And shortly after that, the president resigned. Uh, it, it was, uh, he, he famously said, you know, in a very passionate speech, uh, no man is above the law, not even the President of the United States. Uh, and uh, we just stand for the rule of law and not the common uh, frailties of men. How often are you thinking about him these days and at that moment? These days? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, the times have changed so dramatically since then, um, both in the Congress uh, and what, what is acceptable and what's not. I mean, this, if you look, it was a terrible t moment in time for our country and for the Republican Party, uh, but if you if you look at some of the things happening today, it was uh, it pales. 
that pales by comparison. <laughs> it was like uh, some of the things we're seeing now are much are further, far worse than the stuff we saw in Watergate. Not to condone that, I mean, but uh, you know, it's, my dad stood up and uh, did, you know he got, he was ostracized by the party, by the Nixon administration, by his colleagues in Congress, and friends, and uh, and supporters. Uh, but all these years later, it's what he's most finally remembered for. So definitely had an impact on me saying exactly what I think and not caring about the political consequences. Yeah. Now, you also chair the Republican Governors Association. Are you still in touch with a lot of those folks that you served with? And what are some of the pressing issues for voters right now? And can Republicans even coalesce around a, a simple message to, to message to voters with 13 months to go? Yeah, well, actually, I was chairman of uh, the National Governors Association, which was all the governors. So I led all the Republican and Democratic governors through COVID. Uh, you know, I, we, I had a chair's initiative. When you become chairman of the National Governors Association, I had the support of all 50 governors. I really tried to bring people together in that role. And I, my initiative was uh, rebuilding America's infrastructure. I got all 50 governors to agree on a set of principles, which every bit of it got included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, I brought people together to try to help bring about compromise there and get that done. Um, uh, and then uh, COVID broke out. So I led, uh, I don't know, 50-some Zooms with all of America's governors and many of them with the president, vice president, uh, whole coronavirus task force, uh, all the cabinet members. It was, we went from normally governors maybe to see each other four times a year at various conferences. We may talk about a regional issue or, you know, touch base with another. This was multiple times a week, all the governors talking together. So, uh, I think the National Governors Association is a great uh, example also of there is a lot of bipartisanship. You don't see red and blue jerseys. We don't suit up and try to attack each other every day. Where governors are, you know, CEOs who have to govern. And there was a lot of sharing of best practices like, hey, Gov, how are you dealing with this problem in your state? Or are you experiencing this? Or how did this work? Or, you know, here's something that's worked for us that you might want to try. It wasn't really typically, you know, much fighting going on between the governors. I, it was re very refreshing. Um, that's why I think governors are a great uh, training ground for the presidency because they actually run a government and they're in executive capacity in a smaller, uh, you know, capacity, but in doing the same type of job. I also think they're an example for Congress about, hey, why don't we put down the, all the rhetoric and just govern? Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I am still in touch with many of my former colleagues, and uh, six of them are running for president uh, on the Republican side. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people and give them all the advice I can, but uh, current and former governors, I, I still keep a pretty good relationship with on both sides of the aisle, and I continue to, you know, talk with them, and, and I'm um, willing to give anybody, you know, my input and advice whenever they ask for it. We'll stick a pin in that, that 2024 part, uh, question and come right back to it. Uh, you mentioned infrastructure. President Biden was able to deliver a bipartisan infrastructure bill, but he's not getting credit at all from American voters on it. As someone who manages the state, what, why do you think that is? <clears throat> well, I was very involved in that. So, uh, number one, uh, the Biden administration, you know, they were trying to add in to Build Back Better, which was $4 trillion of social spending. Not, that didn't happen. Uh, the Republicans only wanted to spend four or 500 uh, billion on uh, four or five hundred million on um, just roads and bridges, uh, billion four or five hundred billion. Uh, we came up with the compromise about one point two trillion, where we include all infrastructure but not the social spending. And I held a summit at the governor's mansion in Annapolis, kind of unprecedented. I got Republican and Democratic governors who had worked with me on the governor's initiative, and all agreed to. Uh, Republican Democratic senators and congressmen, and we locked them in the room and fed them Maryland crab cakes and alcohol, and uh, we, we didn't let them out until we came up with an agreement. So we walked out of the governor's mansion with an agreement on a definition of what infrastructure was and wasn't. Republicans came, you know, came about three times almost what they were talking about, and we included things like, you know, uh, clean energy and water and treat sewer treatment systems and uh, protecting the grid and cybersecurity and rural broadband. That's all infrastructure type things. Democrats agreed, let's come back and fight about social spending later. So uh, then, you know, I'm involved with a group called No Labels, the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is a centrist in the middle. They were all there, 32 Democrats, 32 Republicans. They really helped, you know, get that thing done. 
I think the reason why we're not getting a lot of credit is the people still don't, still don't have the money. So they're, they're taking forever to write the regs and to get the money out. Most of the states <clears throat> already had long lists of infrastructure projects, and this was helping them backfill and fund some of that. Some of it's trickling out. Some of it still isn't. And people just haven't seen the positive impacts of it yet because, uh, you know, it, t it takes a while to build infrastructure, and we haven't, no nothing's gotten built yet. Did it fall short in any way based off of your purview? You know, I think it's, uh, I think it's really important. Uh, we were falling behind, and our America's crumbling infrastructure was a huge problem. And I give uh, the president uh, credit for getting that done, and I appreciate the people on both sides that pushed it. Uh, it, is really, it truly is a bipartisan bill. One of the few examples of Congress coming together in, in a bipartisan way to actually accomplish something, it's, it should have been, hey, we, let's, what's the next thing we can come on together? But we haven't really found that. Uh, and we mentioned 2024, of course, and the debate stage. What, what's your thought about the first two debates, especially that last one at the Reagan Presidential Library? I don't think Reagan would have liked it much. Um, it, it was, uh, look, I, I think the, the big problem here, uh, the overarching problem, is that, in my opinion, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party needs to move on from Donald Trump. I think he's the worst thing to happen to the Republican Party and to the country. I don't think, uh, you know, I think he's disqualified himself from being president. I don't think he's a nominee that can win the election. And I'm, I keep being hopeful that some other Republican r can rise up and uh, become uh, the alternative that could win. And it hasn't happened yet. Uh, you know, we're, even though he doesn't show up for the debates, he still sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Uh, and so all these distractions uh, politically, you know, Trump, Trump's legal trials, it's like court TV now. We're not following. There, there are really good candidates on the stage talking about issues that people care about, but no one cares because all we talk about is Trump and the stupid speaker fight in Washington. All of that stuff is distracting from the very important job of deciding who the next president is going to be. And, you know, quite frankly, 70 percent of the people in America do not want Donald Trump or Joe Biden to be president. And yet somehow we find ourselves at this moment in time with the frustrating uh, situation of that might be our choice. And uh, I'm still hopeful that perhaps uh, a Republican can stand up and, and uh, replace Trump because uh, we can't continue to double down on failure. We've lost the last three elections in a row because of Trump. Uh, and I, I frankly think the Democrats ought to pick a stronger nominee than, than Joe Biden. I mean, they're very concerned. Fifty nine percent of Democratic primary voters don't want Biden. Seventy some percent of the people in America think that he's you know, too old and not capable of doing another term. And so I, I, I think most people uh, it doesn't look like it's happening, but I think they'd like to see two new choices from the two parties. And and I think they say, are these the two best people in America we can come up with? to offer the voters in next November. How did we get here, though, right? Because in 2020, there was supposed to be some soul-searching after November, then more soul-searching after January 6th, then more soul-searching after the 2022 midterms, and yet Donald Trump has a 50-point lead yeah. on the rest of the field? Yeah, it's very uh, frustrating to me because I've been uh, probably the strongest uh, Trump critic from the time he came down in the Republican Party as elected state leader. Uh, uh, from the time he came down the escalator and stood up to him on a number of issues. And I've been saying forever that we were eventually going to move away. I felt like I was on a life raft by myself and this, you know, t Trump Titanic was going by. Well, a lot of people are jumping off the boat. We do need a bigger life raft, but it's not happening fast enough. Uh, so now Trump went from about 90 percent of, you know, Republican primary voters to about 50. That's a good, that's positive. But the fact that there are still that many people after everything that's happened that are behind them. It's frustrating. Um, and, but I would just, I'm still, I'm a hopeful person, and uh, we do have some great alternatives. And I'm just hopeful that, uh, you know, between now and the first, you know, when you get to Iowa, New Hampshire, you know, we're about six months away from the real action, and that's an eternity in politics in any political year. And I think, you know, this year, 2024, I can't tell you what's going to happen. Uh, it, 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 I can tell you it's going to be the most interesting and wild ride we've ever seen. And uh, I, I, what, we're, what we think is going to happen today may not be what we're thinking uh, in the spring so or by next fall. Do you think a dark horse could emerge, someone who isn't on the debate stage or on the stage right now? I think it's hard. Uh, if, 
you know, the, the primary, I think we just passed the, f the first deadline. October 9th was the Nevada filing deadline. And a number of others are coming up pretty quickly. So uh, there was all this talk about, you know, would, uh, you know, a couple of my gubernatorial friends, uh, would Glenn Youngkin or Brian Kemp get in the race? That's not, not going to happen. I mean, they've missed the deadlines already. And I think, you know, one more, having seven governors or 12 candidates running isn't going to make a difference. But I'm hopeful in one of the, we can, uh, I think we need to shrink the field we need to arrive at a couple of strong candidates, so we're not splitting that 50% among 10 or 11 people. And I, I can't tell you who that's going to be, but I think that we ought to. We, we need to get some people out of the race. Will Hurd, uh, who I really respect, uh, but what his campaign wasn't getting a lot of attention and he wasn't getting traction. I think he made the right decision in getting out, and he got behind Nikki Haley, uh, who I think has you know been of late really catching a little fire and getting some traction. So I think we'll probably see more of that in the coming weeks and months. Has she been the, the strongest uh, con contender to Trump, in your opinion, so far? I think it's, it's uh, there, there's no real standout. Like, so DeSantis is, <clears throat> I think, the, you know, challenging in Iowa. Uh, Chris Christie is, is making a difference and challenging the only one taking Trump head on. He's doing great in, in New Hampshire. Uh, and Nikki Haley's, um, you know, moving up and doing very well in uh, still, still not winning her home state of South Carolina. Um, I thought Nikki had a great uh, first debate, not so great on the second debate. Uh, she got a little bit of a bump, but then didn't really keep moving up. And unfortunately, we still have Trump you know, just uh, wiping everybody out. And now you mentioned no labels. Obviously, it's been generating a, a lot of buzz as well. I mean, no label seems to be a reaction to, as you mentioned, the fact that Americans are showing in surveys that they have no appetite for a rematch. But what does no label stand for? What would a candidate that a no labels candidate put forth as a platform? Well, first of all, no labels is an organization that's focused on bipartisanship, on everything that I believe in and stand for, everything we've been talking about here this morning. They've been around for 13 years. Uh, they helped form the Problem Solvers Caucus, which I worked with to try to get infrastructure done. They're also the ones that were trying to take us back from the brink on this budget crisis. They're the ones that are the grown-ups in the room on this trying to fix this speaker battle. Uh, so there, it, it was started by some Clinton administration officials. It's very, it is bipartisan. A lot of Republicans and Democrats involved. They're half Democrats, half Republicans, members of the Problem Solvers, 32 of each, about 10 members of the Senate that work together with so it's been about, it wasn't about this, this new thing that everybody's focused on. A lot of people didn't know about it or didn't hear about it. But I got involved about three years ago when I finished my chairmanship of the National Governors Association. They asked me if I would um, work with the group as an honorary, uh, honorary co-chairman uh, with Joe Lieberman, who was a founding chairman of the organization, and I, I agreed to. We've been working through those, bringing people together and having some success. The new thing is, because America is so divided, because 70% don't want Biden or Trump, because our politics are so broken that they're talking about the kind of a, in case of emergency, break glass, you know, insurance policy to say, if America does not want A or B, that perhaps uh, they will uh, at least give the opportunity by getting access to the ballot to give a, a C. And they're talking about not forming a third party. They have no interest in that. Uh, they're talking about the potential of a unity ticket where a Republican and a Democrat say, you know, they have the courage to uh, put the country over party and, uh, and say, for the good of the country, we're going to put up a ticket and run. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'm still hopeful that uh, Biden and Trump won't be the nominees. Um, and that would be my preference. But there's no question that people are interested in this, that Democrats have reacted so, I mean, they're panicked over this idea. Uh, because 68% of the people in the country said they would like to see a third alternative, and 44% of the people in the country are now uh, independent, uh, far larger than the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. And if ever there was a time, I mean, I, I get the whole skepticism that's never happened, you know, don't have the infrastructure. If ever there was a time for it to work, it would be now, where people are so disgusted with both parties and both candidates. And now, RFK Jr. yesterday, he declared that he's going to run as an independent. Cornell West did as well. One of the criticisms, I think President Biden just last week said it would be a mistake for no labels to move forward with a candidate. Does that remove some of that criticism then for no labels to put forth a candidate with, with West and, and Kennedy Jr. in there? It's in funny. I, I think it's just more and more confusing. 
Um, I don't know how it's going to shake out, but it's, it was funny that Cornell West, uh, who obviously was drawing 100% of his votes from Biden, and he was at 4 or 5%, uh, that he, they, they didn't really go after him. And uh, Kennedy, who's a lifelong Democrat with a, you know, uh, his name is like royalty in the Democratic Party, they didn't really go after him. Uh, no labels was the one they were they were trying to blow up, and they're spending millions of dollars of dark money to try to undermine this citizen group from trying to give people potentially more choices. You got to wonder why. And uh, you know, I would say, um, you know, obviously they're taking it much more seriously than the other two, um, but. Even though Kennedy is a Democrat, uh, and so is Cornell West, that um, you know they're they're more concerned about no labels. They thought it was going to be a Democrat at the top of the ticket. I think they were concerned about Joe Manchin. I think if you, you have all these Democrats running against the president, but not you know, I think Kennedy decided he couldn't. Get, the Democratic Party was not going to have a par, a, a comp, competitive primary, so he went outside to try to do that. But uh, you know, he's also got some, he's not the third party candidate America's looking for, in my opinion, and he's got some kind of crazy ideas. And, uh, but to, to refute the Democrats' claim, the polls have already shown that he's taken more from Trump than from Biden. And the last time we had a successful candidate was Ross Perot, who was a Republican who took away from Bush, not Clinton. So I think there's a lot of hype, a lot of charges out there, and a lot of kind of attacks that nobody knows if any of it's any, uh, true. No one has any idea what's going to happen next year. Gotcha. Two more questions. You mentioned dark money. No labels is pretty opaque, too. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how it gets its donors, why it doesn't release the donor list? Well, it's a, uh, a tax-exempt organization just like all the others. There are thousands of C4s and 527s in Washington, including all the ones that are attacking them. Um, they're not a party, and it's not a candidate, so they don't file the same disclosures. that you, if, if, in fact, they did have a candidate... They don't want to form a party, but if they're backing a candidate, obviously they have to set up new committees and follow all the same rules. But it's really hypocritical that the people who keep talking about defending democracy are attacking democracy, and the people who are attacking no labels as dark money are spending dark money to do so because they're all the same kind of organizations. Uh, the third way is one that comes to mind. And in March, when you penned your op-ed, uh saying that you weren't going to run, right? The dynamics were much different. Uh, at the time, Trump had a narrow elite, narrower lead over the field. DeSantis had yet to declare, and even some hypothetical polls had him leading. Are you changing your mind at all? Will you run for president? You know, back in March, I made the tough decision because, you know, I left as, uh, you know, the, I think the top governor in America in a very hostile environment uh, where it was difficult to get things done, but we did. Um, I think I had the... the you know, had proven the, uh, the best ability to win swing voters, uh, independents and Democrats and soft Republicans. It, I thought it was a very difficult path through the Republican primary, and I didn't want to have a repeat of 2016 um, where we had a multi-car pileup, and that's exactly what is happening, 11 candidates. If there were one strong candidate, they might be at 50% right now, but they're not. There's 10 or 11 or 12. Uh, so it's exactly what I was afraid was going to happen is happening. I'm very glad I made that that decision, um, even though it was a hard one to make, I think it was the right one for the right reason. I, my goal is to get someone other than Donald Trump, and I didn't think I was going to be able to contribute to that by just being in there with all these other guys. I think I'd be in the same spot, all the rest of them, in a single digit somewhere struggling for attention. Um, I said at that time uh, that um, I just never ruled out. I didn't close the door on this other thing. It's not something I'm pursuing. It's not something I'm working toward. It's not something I've decided to do. It's not why I was involved in no labels. Uh, but you know, if, if, if the country is in that bad a shape next spring and those are the two nominees and it looks like there's a path, I would have no interest in being a spoiler. I don't want to run a race to nibble around the edges. If, if I thought there was a path to success to win the race, then um, I just said I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't shut the door to that opportunity. And how are you feeling now? I'm feeling more confused than ever. <laughs> it sounds like you may be leaning towards it. No, I don't know about that. Don't be pushing me now. Come on. I mean, you just ticked <laughs> off a bunch of metrics. Yeah. Swing st uh, blue state, getting elected, dealing with a, a myriad of issues that are a microcosm to what's facing the country. Yeah. And then, again, the, the, the heroism that we spoke about earlier with your father. I just don't understand what, what the hesitation would be. Well, I, um, again, I'm trying to beat Donald Trump in a primary, and I'm still hopeful that the Democrats can come up with somebody other than Joe Biden. And uh, we still have a long way to see. We won't know that until Super Tuesday next March. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just 
continuing to try to be a voice of reason. Um, I, I don't have... I don't have a need to be in elective office myself, but I do care very deeply about getting the Republican Party back on track, and I care very deeply about the, the country being in a really difficult spot right now. So however I can serve, I'm still trying to figure that out, but I'm not, I'm not walking away, and I'm not willing to give up, and it's just, it's just too important.